with fear and trembling. Praise God. It pleases me to tell you that as, as I have looked at Romans chapter 6 again, it's one of the most profound chapters of the Bible. And one which many scholars have dwelt in for so many years and I've got so much revelation from. It pleases me to know that we're teaching along the same line that God, you know, God always amazes me how he gives us a word in NICC. We take it not for granted, the word that God gives us. An awesome word, you know, and I believe that if we will take it into practice and really pursue it, we will see our lives being changed. You may not see it automatically, but trust me, it will come along in the name of Jesus. So I'm pleased that I'm going to, I'm going to read from, uh, I think let's take it from verse 1 and I'll skip along and just share a couple of things with us today. Praise God. In verse 1 it says, what then shall we, what shall we say then? Shall we go on sinning so that grace may increase? By no means. We die to sin. How can we live in it any longer? Or don't you know that all of us who were baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death. We were therefore buried with him through baptism into death in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, we too may live a new life. If we have been united with him like this in his death, we will certainly also be united with him in his resurrection. Remember, we talked about the fact that we are experiencing, or we are to experience, the resurrection power of God. Why? Because we were buried with Christ in baptism. Actually, let me just say this. One of the most important things about baptism in water, immersion in water, not, I have a a bit of water on my head. That's not baptism, as far as the Bible is concerned. Baptism is immersion in water. Because the Bible says to us that when Jesus came up out of the water, so it's an immersion. When the Ethiopian eunuch was being baptized, he went down into the water and came out of it. So there's no, I put some water on your head and you're baptized. No, that's not scripture. But then we know that, you know what? Baptism tells us that as we go into the water, we are buried and a new person comes up. Guess what? Your obedience to baptism is one of the keys to your complete being born again salvation as God ordained it. In Mark 16, it says those who believe and what? And are baptized. It's not only believe. That's why some people who say they're born again, when you start talking about baptism, they avoid it. I don't know whether you've noticed that. Some people, you say, okay, you've been born again, now you've made a confession, come and be baptized. They say, well, I'm not ready. It's incomplete. It's unbaptized. So, when you are, when you are laid into the water, you kind of deny yourself. Your old self is denied, is buried, is crucified with Christ. A new person arises, and you arise in the resurrection power of, of, of Jesus. So it says here, right here in verse uh, 6 here, For we know that our old self was crucified with him, so that the body of sin might be done away with. You see, unless sin fulfills its ultimate end, which is what? The wages of sin is what? Death. Death. Unless you die in baptism, <coughs> you can't live a new life. So actually, when you are buried into the water, you pay. In some sense, you die. And then you're resurrected into a new life. So, let's read it again, verse 6. For we know that our old self was crucified with him, so that the body of sin might be done away with, that we should no longer be slaves to sin, 
Because anyone who has died has been freed from sin. And we talked a lot about that in the past few weeks. Now, if we died with Christ, we believe that we also live with him. Then is the we know statement. For we know that since Christ was raised from the dead, he cannot die again. Death no longer has mastery over him. The death, he died, he died to sin. Whose sin? His own or ours? Ours. Once for all. But the life he lives, he lives to God. In the same way, count yourself dead to sin, but alive to God in Christ Jesus. Verse 12, very important. Therefore, do not let sin reign over your mortal body so that you obey its evil desires. What the Bible says, do not let sin reign. What's it saying to us there? It says that you now have the power to either allow it to reign or not reign. You, you have the power to either sin or not sin. When the Bible says, do not let this book of the law depart from your mouth, what's he saying? It's an action from us. We have the power to either read the word, say the word, or not say it. So when he says, do not let sin reign in your mortal body, you have been buried, your old nature is gone, a new nature has come, the nature of Christ, that allows you to be righteous to God. So you have a choice now. Therefore, verse 12, do not let sin reign in your mortal body so that you obey its evil desires. Do not offer the parts of your body to sin as instruments of wickedness, but rather offer yourselves to God as those who have been brought from death to life. And offer the parts of your body. What are the parts of your body? Your mouth, your mind, your legs, your nose, your eyes, offer it yourself to God as those who have been brought from death to life and offer the parts of your body as instruments of righteousness. For sin shall not be your master because you are not under law but under grace. It's really re emphasizing the point that you've been delivered from sin. It's re-emphasizing the point that the power that compelled you to sin has been removed. It's re-emphasizing the point that you now have the power of God in your life to allow you to either decide to sin or not to sin. What then shall we sin because we're not under law but under grace? By no means. Don't you know that when you offer yourselves to somebody to obey him as slaves, you are slaves to the one whom you obey. This question here in verse 15 is different from the one in verse, verse 1. Verse 1 says, shall we, what shall we say then? Shall we go on sinning? Which means, shall we go on living in sin? Verse 15 it's different. It says, what then shall we, shall we sin because we are not under law but under grace? Or what about the sin we do sometimes? Shall we go on doing that too? By no means. He tells us there. Verse 17. But thanks be to God that though you used to be slaves to sin, you all actually obeyed the form of teaching to which you were entrusted. You have been set free from sin. Say after me, I've been set free, been set free from, sin. from sin. And I have become, I have become slaves, slaves to righteousness. To righteousness. Verse 19. I put this in human terms because you're weak in your natural selves. Just as you used to offer the parts of your body in slavery to impurity 
and to ever increasing wickedness. So now, offer them in slavery to righteousness, leading to holiness. Because, you know, we sang a song today. The truth is, without holiness, no one can do what? No one can see God. So when we pray, open the eyes of my heart. Live in holiness. Why? Because you're already holy. Bible says in verse 20, when you were slaves to sin, you were free from the control of righteousness. What benefit did you reap at that time from the things you are now ashamed of? You know, one of the things that if you if you are if you were if you didn't have the opportunity to get saved at a young age, and you get saved as an adult, like me. So I got saved when I was 35, thereabouts. So I look back into the way I've lived, and I'm ashamed. I can look back and say, all the stuff that I thought I was doing, I was feeling cold. I'm ashamed of it. I look back and I say, God, thank you, Jesus. But I thought I was cool then. Somebody know what I'm talking about here. You're all looking at me. Yeah. <laughs> Maybe you're not ashamed yet. You look back and say, that was stupid. All the people I've hurt along the way. All the nonsense I did along the way. That's, that's hurtful. So if you look back, you're ashamed of it. It says, what benefits did you reap at that time from the things you are now ashamed of? Those things result in death. But now, you have been set free from sin and have become slaves to God. The benefit you reap is eternal life. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. One of the points of this teaching is that when you, when you think about it very carefully, Romans chapter 6 emphasizes our return to Genesis 2. In Genesis 2, Adam had a choice. Either to sin or not to sin. He had what we call, what do we call that thing he had? It starts with an F. Free will. Free will means I have a choice either to disobey God or to obey God. And you know, when you get saved, you are translated back to that type of mindset and position where you can now choose to either obey God or not. God didn't remove your free will. You know what? I wish many times he did for me. I wish the only thing I could think about is just doing God's will. All the time. So the question is, how comes we still sin sometimes? We're not talking about now living in sin. You know, when you live in sin, even though you are sinning, you don't feel anything. Well, I don't know whether you're born again. I don't know about that. You are living in sin and you're okay with it. Then I doubt whether you are saved. Because really, when you are born again and you sin, your mind should bear witness and make you uncomfortable with that act of sin. Because you know what happens? Because you have the Holy Spirit in you, the Bible tells us in Ephesians chapter 5, not to grieve the Holy Spirit with whom you are sealed. When, because the Holy Ghost is in you, when a believer sins, they feel uncomfortable to remain in it. When an unbeliever sins, that's their nature. They don't feel uncomfortable. So here, why does the believer still sin? There are two words 
that tells us why. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to explain this to you, then give the scripture. Hopefully we can do this in 15, 20 minutes. One of them is obedience. Say obedience. obedience. The second one is faith. Say faith. faith. So obedience and faith is the reason why some believers still sin. Because your free will was not taken away. Let me explain what I mean by that. The way that God sets things up is that you need to obey his word to enjoy his blessings. And part of that is everything that God has for you. God has a structure. God has a process. God has a plan. That's how his kingdom works. You've got to obey. So what does uh, what does Samuel say to Saul? When Saul was told to annihilate the Amalekites, and he didn't. You know, he kept some things for himself. And some of the men, yeah. you know, he liked some nice stuff. Yeah. He, he kind of kept it. And he goes, you know, we're going to sacrifice this to your God. And someone said something to Saul. Mm -hmm. Obedience is better than sacrifice. I'm interested in your sacrifices. I'm interested in your obedience. So the structure of God is that we need to obey. But however, the devil brings along something else to cause us to disobey. Every time we sin, there is something that happens. But the way that God sets this up is that we should obey his word. And we don't have a problem with that. We say, well, yeah, you've got to obey God's word. But what about this one? You've got to obey God's people. Well, that's where the believer begins to have a problem. It's okay for me to say I should obey God. Yeah, I'll obey God. But God's people, uh, 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 wait a minute. Wait a minute. You are telling me to obey man. Hang on. Let's talk about this carefully. This is what the enemy uses. When we talk about obeying God's people, we're talking about obeying good leadership and obeying good disciples. And then... Instead of us obeying the, the word of God, God's way is that we are supposed to obey by being slaves to Christ. Slave to Christ. Slave to Christ means what? What do you think a slave means? Slave to Christ means what? Totally submitted. Whatever Jesus says is what I'm going to do. Period. It don't matter how I feel, a slave does not have a say. That's another word we don't like. I'm no longer a slave. No, no, no. You, if you're born again, you're a slave to Christ. Paul consistently called himself a slave to Christ, not a slave to the world. You're going to be a slave to something. If you're not a slave to Jesus, you are either a slave to yourself or you're a slave to the devil. But Satan brings something. He calls it control. Say control. I got it in red because that's what Satan does. He brings, he brings a word. He says, don't let anybody control you. Don't let anybody tell you what to do. Because he, def he defines control, not as slave to Christ, what control means manipulation, somebody having undue influence on you, somebody having negative influence on, on you. And he gives the believer reasons and stories. Why? You must not allow control. He will tell you, you know how old you are? Nobody should tell you at this age what to do. You know what you achieved? You know how far you've gone, maybe in your career, or in your marriage, or in this? Nobody should be able to tell you what to do. But he's going somewhere with this. He will tell you stories of men of God who have abused somebody who submitted to them. Actually, you know what? If you think about this, if you think about control, 
as the, as the enemy uses it as a negative word, you think about the word submission. You go say the word submission to most women. The enemy has twisted that word so that in their mind, when they hear submission, they don't want it. Yet, God says submit to your husband. You see, that comes to me what I'm saying. What the enemy has done is to twist the word so that you don't want to submit. Yet, God requires you in his own order that you must submit to your husband. Because women don't realize submission is power. Say after me, submission, submission. Is, power. is power. If you want to have power over your husband, you submit. Okay, we'll deal with that another day. It brings stories. It will show you versions of people who have controlled others negatively. They've had undue influence on people. They've negatively controlled people. But that's not his desire. His real intention to give you all that and talk to you about control is that he wants your free will. That's the point. He wants your free will. When he gets your free will, you know what? You know what's happening really? The reality is that because you have a free will, just like Adam did, Adam had free will, whenever you dethrone Jesus, guess what happens on the other side? You enthrone the devil. Every time you choose to disobey God, you enthrone the devil. That's what he really wants. So him telling you about control, about disobedience, is to make sure you dethrone Jesus. Is to say, mm, that thing that God wants me to do, maybe it's not quite how it should be. We're talking about why the believer still sings. When he dethrones, when you dethrone Christ, you enthrone the devil, and then what happens is he now wants you to develop new habits. Somebody say habits. habits. New habits. And it's going to start with small things. Habits, habits, whether I would like it or not, habits are easier, it's easier to form a negative habit. It takes longer to get rid of it. Actually, to get rid of a negative habit, you sometimes have to do, uh, what's that what's that thing called when somebody is uh, on drugs and they need to, cold turkey. That's the only way it works. If you have a patch of land and you do nothing with it, automatically what grows? Wheat. You don't have to pray about it. You don't need to pray. But if you want it to remain without wheat, what do you need to do? You've got to cultivate it. You've got to work at it. To make good habits, you work at it. So the enemy comes and says, you know what? I want your free will, but in disguise. Don't let anybody control you. Don't let anybody tell you what to do. You are of age now. And now I want you to be forming habits and small things. What well, small things like what? Somebody cannot even tell you, my sister, the clothes you are wearing are not quite what a Christian should be wearing. Hey! You can't tell me what to do. The way you spoke to that brother is not the best way. Hey, he can't tell me how to talk to anyone. I, you know, I'll talk to how I like. My sister, that thing you, you did is not right. Hey, you can't. I'm a man. You can't tell me where to go. I'll go where I want. Small habits. You know what? It's setting you up for a big fall. The small habits is a setup for a big one. Do you, know, do you know what happened in James? In James chapter 1. Go to James chapter 1. One analysis I saw 
Pastor T.D. Jakes do one day was really profound. About James 1, he set a circle around him. In James 1, when tempted, no one should say, God is tempting me. For God cannot be tempted by evil, nor does he tempt anyone, but each one is tempted. When by his own evil desire, he's dragged away and enticed. Then after desire has conceived, it gives birth to sin. And sin, when full grown, gives birth to death. Every small habit that is not of God, that we keep cultivating, that we say, you can't tell me what to do, you cannot control me, you cannot do this, we are setting ourselves up for a big one. Do you realize that it was not the first time the devil spoke to Eve? When you read carefully, it sounds as though they've been having numerous conversations. And it sounds as though Adam was there when they've had those numerous conversations and he didn't do nothing about it. It was not the first time he said, okay, oh, you know what, this fruit just don't eat. Do you want to listen to him? They were talked for a while. Once those habits are enshrined and entrenched, it now gives you a big one. That's why a believer can go marry an unbeliever. Because they're not used to being told what to do. It's easy now. Because the habits are already there. The Christian that sleeps around in church. The habits are already there. They can't, nobody can tell them what to do. Nobody. God cannot tell them what to do. The people that God placed around them cannot tell them what to do. They're set up for a big fall. You could be a man of God too. Nobody can tell them what to do. I am the pastor. How dare you tell me anything? You understand that being right? Yeah, you understand that? We all understand that being right? But you know what? It's more prevalent in the congregation than it is to the men of God. It's only the men of God ones that are exposed because of their position. Well, you are no different from the man of God. In the sense that how God loves you is how he loves the man of God. You think God loves the man of God more. So you think you can do whatever you like. It doesn't matter. It matters. Because if you're weak, the kingdom is weak. So, as the enemy now causes us to have dethroned Christ, enthroned him, he now gives us faith. What is faith? You don't want to talk about faith? What is faith? Define faith to me. Now, what is faith? According to Hebrews chapter 11 verse 1. Sure of what you hope for. Do you know what? That is just a definition. God now gives you his own type of faith people. Right? But the but definition of faith still remains. Faith is being sure of what you hope for. Do you know what? Sin. You can have faith in sin. Do you know that? Do you know you can have faith in sin? Do you know that the pleasure of sin as described for us also in the book of Hebrews? And what happens is the enemy now, because you form those habits, it gives you faith in sin more than faith in God. Let me tell you, let me give an example so that you understand. Anybody who wants to commit adultery, for example, he has faith, or she or he has faith in the outcome of what they're going to get from the adultery. Am I correct? Otherwise, you won't do it, right? Because there is pleasure in sin. So 
you are sold that pleasure. Because you are sold that pleasure, really, you have faith in it. So I'm talking to you about obedience and faith and why we sin. If a believer still sin, the enemy has sold you faith in sin. Don't talk to that person. Don't forgive them. Why? Because you will still feel good for not forgiving them. So he has given you pleasure in it. That's how faith is developed. And faith in the pleasure of sin. So let's look at two men of God. In talking about obedience and faith and submission. Let's look at two men of God. Go back with, to me with uh, to Galatians chapter 2. Galatians chapter 2. Just follow me along with this. Think along with me. In Hebrews 11 we are given a definition of faith. That's not all. That's just a definition Every time we think about the pleasure of sin, we're having faith in sin. In Galatians chapter 2, here is a man of God here who is submitted. And I've always said this, that if you think about the life of Paul, Paul had no reason whatsoever to be submitted to anyone. If God appeared to him, he saw Jesus. He had revelation upon revelation. He had more revelation than the people who even dwelt with Jesus. But, Galatians chapter 2, verse 1 says, 14 years later, I went up again to Jerusalem, this time with Barnabas. I took Titus along also. I went in response to a revelation. And set before them the gospel that I preached among the Gentiles. But I did this privately to those who seemed to be leaders. For fear that I was, I, had, I was running or had run my race in vain. Paul goes to submit the word of God that he has received. Paul is submitted heavily. Paul was given the word of God and he still submitted that word of God to other leaders and said, well, guys, this is what God gave me to preach. What do you think? They could have told him, uh -uh, you are off your head here. He submitted himself to them. You, you will notice when Paul traveled, he traveled with people and they could speak into his life. But then look at another man of God. Go to 2 Samuel chapter 11. What we're talking about here has nothing to do with whether I'm spiritual or not spiritual. If you're not careful, you'll obey the devil. We need to be careful. The Bible says in 2 Samuel 11, one, one evening. No, you know, actually, let's read from verse 1. In the spring at the time when kings go off to war, David sent Joab out with the king's men and the whole Israelite army. They destroyed the Ammonites and besieged Rabbah. But David remained in Jerusalem. That verse alone tells you David was in error. Because that was the season when you go to war. Who are the Ammonites and the Moabites? Where are they from? Daughters of Lot. Thank you. They're daughters of Lot. They came about by what? Incest. That was the season when David in his life should put down sexual sin. Verse 1 was the season the kings go to war. There could come a time in your life when that's when you should put down sexual sin. You should fight it and resist it. But David didn't. The Bible says one evening David got up from his bed and walked around on the roof of the palace. From the roof he saw a woman bathing. Is that God's will for him to have seen that woman bathing? Do you know why she was bathing in the open? 
he wasn't supposed to be around. But by demonic providence, he saw her. By demonic providence, he saw her. The woman was very beautiful. And David sent someone to find out about her. The man said, isn't this Bathsheba, the daughter of Eliam and the wife of Uriah? Isn't this Bathsheba, the wife of one of your armor bearers? Really? Actually, it means David, this woman, she's the wife of one of us. The daughter of Eliam, the wife of Ryan the Hittite, then David sent messengers to get her. David said, doesn't matter, bring her. And you know what David's problem was? He had surrounded himself with yes men. Unlike Paul. I bet you the kind of people that went around with Paul, if Paul did something wrong, they'll tell him. You keep surrounding yourself with people that agree with everything you do. The enemy is setting you up for a fall. Every time you want to do something, you have some friends. If you tell them, anything goes. They're not friends. They're used by the devil. You say, oh, I went out last week and this guy offended me. I cursed him. I cursed his mother, I cursed his father. They goes, yes! <laughs> Those men. <laughs> In fact, <laughs> that's what happened to me too yesterday. <laughs> that's what David had around him. Yes, men. They couldn't stand to say, no, we're not going to call Bathsheba. What they didn't realize is if David slept with Uriah's wife, he could sleep with their wives. They weren't thinking about that. It was, ah, anyway, it's Uriah's wife he wants. He doesn't want my wife. Doesn't matter. The two times that David sinned, he disobeyed the orders of God. When we disobey the order of God, we enthrone the devil. And we read in Romans chapter 6, the wages of sin is death. Period. It's like a full stop. Boom. The wages of sin always, always brings death. Never brings anything but death. But since we have been raised from death, why go back to that life? You're in a church like this. God has placed believers around you. Listen to what they have to say that sticks with the word of God. Nobody should be able to tell you stuff that is not related to the word, but if it relates to the word of God, obey it. Don't think that God will be the only one talking to you. When God talks to you, he's also expecting his people to talk to you. If God cannot get his people to talk to you, you've lost out. It's more likely the enemy will be enthroned. The reason why the believer sins is because they have faith in pleasure of sin. You know what? David thought when he slept with Bathsheba, he would be all right. And he may have been all right for five minutes. You know what would have happened if one of the men said, no, we're not going to go and call him? They would have said, David, go get a shower, mate. And David would have been upset. He go get a shower. He's like, ah. He would tell you, David, knowing him, he would say, man, thank you for saving my life. It was a time your friends, those who are closest to you, were supposed to stand with you. But at that time, maybe David, maybe David used to be told anymore what to do. 
never get to a point. Some people say, if I've made up my mind, I've made up my mind. You can't tell me nothing. You're going to fall one day. You're going to fall one day. You must never, nobody must ever make up their mind to such a place where the word of God cannot correct them. When somebody brings you the word of God, it must be able to change your mind. Your mind should never be so rigid. It should never be so made up that the word of God cannot change it. That's the devil at work. Whenever you say, I've made up my mind, there's nothing. I've had people tell me. And it's amazing. And I have to stop. I have people tell me, yeah, yeah, pastor, yeah, uh-huh, uh-huh. I know what the Bible says. This is why I say, uh-uh, yeah, um, uh-huh. But pastor, you don't understand. Once I made up my mind, nothing can change it. I say, read, they say, yeah, I read it, uh-huh, uh, yeah, mm, I, yeah, uh, but I made up my mind. So I stop. I say, okay, praise the Lord. There's no more conversation. You made up your mind. Because I'm telling you what the word of God said. You read it. I get them to read it themselves. They read it. They read it. Uh, uh, yeah, um, uh, yeah. Okay. But. The enemy is enthroned. We don't need to go back to what Adam did in chapter 3. We don't need that. Let's follow what Jesus has set up for us. Let's have this eternal life. Let's enjoy the goodness of God. Let's enjoy all the riches that God has for us. Let's enjoy his glory. Let's enjoy his power. Let's enjoy his holiness. Let's enjoy his grace. Don't enthrone the devil. Set apart Jesus as Lord in your heart. Amen? Amen. There's no pleasure in sin. It's a lie. It leads to death. We have catalog of stories in the scriptures that teaches us this principle. There is no pleasure in sin. It's only death there is. We don't need it. Follow the process and the order that God has put around you. Enjoy the word of God to protect you and guide you. Enjoy God's people to protect and guide you. Yeah, God's people are not perfect. Yeah. We are perfect on one sense, but we're working on our perfection, so you're going to find faults. If I look in your life, I'll find faults too. If you look in my life, you'll find faults too. But it should not be faults you cannot deal with. We shouldn't look in each other's lives and be finding certain things like just like, uh, uh, uh. No, you're just enjoying that sin. No, that shouldn't be that. No, that's not what I'm talking about. So, let's enjoy what God has put around us. Let's enjoy it together as a church. Let us enjoy God's goodness. Let's enjoy his favor. Amen? Amen. Amen. Let's enthrone Christ in our hearts. That's what Romans chapter 6 is teaching us. Praise the Lord. Let us pray, please.